Hello everybody, Colin Archibald here again. The next step in our discussion of multi-threaded programs in Java is to talk about threads that coordinate with each other somehow. And um, there is a new keyword, synchronized, that we'll introduce in this video. And we'll talk about the methods that are in the object class wait, notify, notify all. This is an important component of the Java certification exam, so a bunch of people are asking me if I would work on a video that, it would, that would explain these. And it's, it's perhaps the hardest one that I've had to explain, but we're going to do it. That's why I'm here in the video this time. Well, let's talk about this conceptually from the big picture. What, what's going on here? Um, multiple threads share data. So when you create a thread object, you might somehow give them access to an object, um, pass that object reference into the constructor, for example. And these threads, multiple threads that have access to the same data, they might be trying to change the variables um, spelled wrong at the same time. And this is a common problem. Databases do this all the time, and the database is responsible for locking the data that the um, that the user is accessing until the user is done with that part. So when you go to buy your uh, movie ticket online, you wouldn't want the ticket to be gone by the time you get your credit card out of your wallet. You you expect that that piece of information to be locked while you have access to it. So think of yourself as the, the thread having access to some data. You don't want other threads having access to that data while you have access to it, or the results will be um, unpredictable at best. Okay, so in Java there's the concept of a lock. And I have, a, I have an object right here. It's coffee cup. And this coffee cup is an instance of the class cup, and every object in Java has a lock associated with it. So there's a lock on this object. And if you, as a thread, want to manipulate this object, the instance variable in this object, you're going to ask for the lock first. And while you have the lock, other threads cannot have access to the data inside the cup. And when you're done, you give the lock back. So there's the mechanism. It's not that hard. If you're a thread and you have access to an object, um, you ask for the lock on the object first, then you manipulate the data in the object while it's safe to do so, and then you give the lock back. So some other thread that has access to this object might then want to do the same thing, ask for the object, manipulate the data, and then give the lock back, making the object accessible to other threads. Um, some of this is done for you in some places. So if you have a collection of objects, this is a common example, if you have a collection of objects and you have lots of threads accessing a large collection of objects, you will want that collection to be thread safe so that um, your threads will not corrupt the data within that collection. So the keyword that we're adding now is synchronized and I'm going to make some Java code to explain this. So there will be an object of type cup being accessed by two threads, and the threads will be a waiter and a customer. And the customer wants to drink the coffee, and the waiter wants to put more coffee in the cup. So it's the same cup and two actors, or two um, threads, that are manipulating the same piece of data. So let's look at um, some code that would implement this small example to demonstrate the use of um, synchronized. Let's go into Eclipse and do that now. So we have this very small test 
and I um, let me go through with these one by one and then come back and revisit each of them. We make an instance of the of the cup class. So we have one object type cup and then I'm going to make one waiter and one customer, Bob and Steve. And these are threads. So we pass the cup object to the constructor of both threads. So now we have the situation where these two threads are sharing data and the data is the cup. And we start both of the threads. And we'll look at the behavior of the threads. The run method of the threads are what the behavior of each thread is. So Bob's job is to pour the coffee and Steve's job is to drink the coffee. At the end, we well, we go to sleep for a couple of seconds and then at the end, we should have um, no coffee in the cup because we had started out with zero coffee in the cup when we created this object. So far, so good. Let's look at the customer. It's a very small thread. The customer's job is to drink the coffee ten times. Sip, 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 sip. And the waiter's job is to pour the coffee using the cup object. So this is the shared cup object that was passed into the constructor in the test class. So this code is very, very simple. Um, the entire behavior of the waiter is to pour the coffee ten times and the entire behavior of the customer is to drink the coffee ten times using the same cup. Let's look at the cup class. It's a very simple class. It's not a thread. It's a piece of data. An instance of this class, think of it as a piece of data, and it has one integer variable in it, which is how much coffee is in the cup, and it starts out with zero when we call the constructor. We pass in a zero here. Set coffee and get coffee are the ones that Eclipse generated for me. And now let's look at drink and pour. Drink and pour are methods inside of this cup. And so what can a thread do? If a thread has access to this cup object, the thread can call the drink method or the thread can call the pour method. So I wanted this to fail quickly instead of failing um, on the 20,000th try. I wanted it to fail quickly. So here's what I did. I took the instance variable and I stored it in a local variable. And then I subtract one from the local variable. I print out sip and I go to sleep for a small random amount of time. And then I set the instance variable to the local coffee variable. So the effect of this is that the drink method will subtract one from coffee. We store coffee in a local variable, subtract one from it, and then put it back into the instance variable. So it will be one less. And I did this go to sleep for a little bit so that I could force this to fail um, more quickly, have the threads compete in a very awkward way um, for this instance variable coffee. Pour works the same way, except we're going to add one to the local variable. We're going to print out pour, go to sleep for some length of time, and then set the instance variable to the local variable, which is one more than what it started with. So if we run this, we should get zero at the end. So pour and sip are competing. So the two threads are competing for the processor, trying to add one and subtract one from the instance variable coffee. If we run this a few times, we should get different answers. 
This time we get positive 10. We get negative 10. Negative 10. Positive 10. Positive 10. Negative 10. I got 6 a little while ago. And I'm not sure exactly why I'm always getting positive 10 or negative 10. But part of this game is <laughs> all bets are off. We have two threads manipulating a piece of data, and the answer is wrong all the time. So how are we going to fix that? We have to, um, surprisingly, not worry about the threads, but worry about the object. It's the object that has to defend itself. And when we go into the object cup, we have these two methods, drink and pour. And we're going to add the keyword synchronized. Okay, so let's think about what synchronized means. So the waiter, it's the waiter's job to call this method. And the waiter is a thread. And when the waiter is inside of the synchronized code, it has the lock on the object. It holds the lock on the cup. That means that if the other thread tries to enter synchronized code on this object, it might be the same method or a different method. Any of the methods that are synchronized or any of the code that's synchronized, the other thread cannot enter it, cannot enter synchronized code because the first thread has the lock on the object. So one thread that is executing synchronized code on an object prevents all other threads from entering synchronized code on that same object. Let's look at the different behavior that we have now that those two methods are synchronized. Okay, so we poured 10 times into the cup and we drank 10 times from the cup and we wound up with zero coffee, which is the correct answer. And if we run this 100 times, we will always come up with zero at the end, but not always in the same pattern. Look at this one, pour, sip, pour, pour. So the two threads are still competing it's not quite as obvious that they're intermingling their competition, but the synchronizing, the, the blocking of the competing threads is preventing the instance variable from being corrupted. I really should have um, made the accessors and the mutators synchronized as well. So let's go back and think about what we did. The test class is very simple. We made one object and we passed it to the constructor of two different threads. Then we start the threads. So these two threads have the same object. Notice that if we had made two cups and passed one cup to each, the customer and the waiter, the synchronizing would not have any impact. The thread wouldn't be blocked. When the thread takes the lock, it takes the lock on a specific object, protecting the data in that object. It doesn't take the lock on all cups. It takes the lock on that cup. So when a thread enters synchronized code, it takes the lock on the object. Here's where we were printing out the answer after we went to sleep for a few, 
few seconds in main, two seconds in main, printed out the how much coffee was in the cup after these threads had done their drinking and pouring. So the customer, remember the customer thread? is uh, It is a thread, and it's a very simple thread where the run behavior is to just drink 10 times. The waiter thread is also very simple. Its job is to pour 10 times using the same cup object that the customer had. So the thread code is very simple. There's nothing synchronized in the thread code. It's the object that's synchronizing the threads. So this is not the thread. The threads are executing code from this object. So when a thread enters synchronized code, even if it gets interrupted, it loses the processor. Um, another thread cannot enter synchronized code because there's only one lock for the object. Some people refer to this as mutual exclusion. So within the object, we have mutual exclusion of the threads, and that's what the lock is. Some people call this a monitor object. A monitor object, there was a famous paper written about this um, several years ago, and uh, some of the terminology has kind of lost its significance over the years, but a monitor object is one that kind of controls the behavior of the threads, even though this object itself is not a thread. This object is kind of a normal data object. It's not inheriting from thread. It's not a runnable. It has synchronized code within it. And now that all of the um, all of the code that could change this piece of data are synchronized, this object is thread safe. It's quite inefficient, but it's thread safe. Multiple threads that have access to this object cannot change the data in, in a, an unexpected way. Well, I hope this is working for you. It, it makes sense to type in this code and you have a better feel for code that comes off of your own fingers. There, we got a little bit different behavior that time, a sip. So try playing with it. Change the delays, the sleeps, and um, see if you can adjust the behavior of the threads so that you can demonstrate to yourself that uh, this object is thread safe. So the next thing that we have to do is to talk about threads that use wait, notify, notify all. And this is the next step in the complexity of coordinating threads, but it's, it's critical that you understand the synchronized keyword and taking the lock on the object before we proceed to talk about wait, notify, notify all. We had a look at how to synchronize threads to how to have the objects protect themselves to make themselves thread safe so that multiple threads having access to an object won't corrupt the data inside of the objects. So now we, as promised, are going to talk about wait, notify, and notify all. And the idea here is that we want our threads to coordinate with each other to achieve some goal. And the threads that are just using data that protects itself, that's a, that's a big step to have synchronized code. But now the next step after that, if we have synchronized code, why can't the threads communicate with each other in the way where they say, let me know when you've got something for me. Instead of me sitting here sleeping um, inside of synchronized code, preventing other threads from doing what they want to do, why don't I just give up the lock on the object until you tell me that it's time to take the lock back and do the work, do the work I need to do. So, um, the analogy is instead of keeping to check over and over, 
you just sit there and wait to be notified that there is something that's that's going to happen so you detect a situation where you have to wait and then you are notified by someone else so when a thread is in a wait state you can't do anything a thread that's waiting is not executing it doesn't have the processor and other threads can do the work that they need to do and then notify that thread that's in a wait state that it's time for that thread to um, become eligible for the processor again and start doing its work. This is, this is a very complicated way of doing things and if uh, the, the big mistake that people make especially younger programmers is that they will make a, a, a very complicated interaction among the threads and not be able to get it working. So students will present me with um, uh, several hundred lines of code and say my code is not working can you help me figure out what it's doing? And the answer is no. Uh, I really really can't figure out what it's doing. It's too complicated and it's very easy to make code that's really complicated behavior when you have multiple threads um, waiting on each other and notifying each other when something is ready. Uh, so how can we use it in a in a way that is um, usable, that's debuggable, that we can figure out what the code is doing and we can achieve something using this mechanism that hadn't been achieved before. Here's, here's what happens, the, the problems that happen when someone starts to make multiple threads that interact with each other, especially using wait, notify, notify all. Um, you might remember from the previous video that suspend and resume were deprecated from Java um, for this very reason. It, it isn't that they didn't work, it's that people would make code that was so very complicated that no one could figure out how, how it was working or why it wasn't working, more importantly. So the problems, um, starvation of a thread. A thread has work to do, but it never gets the processor because other threads are hogging the processor and it sits there unable to do its work. The other one is deadlock. Some people call this deadly embrace. When two or more threads become interlocked, one is waiting for the other and the other is waiting for a third and the third is waiting for the first. So <clears throat> all manner of complicated situations can happen there where um, you're running the code and then it just stops. And you can't set a breakpoint and walk through and find because it's a timing error. So if you set a breakpoint and you walk through threads, you'll have to have a breakpoint in each thread and then try and walk through them at the exact speed that they would be going and it, it's impossible. You cannot set breakpoints and walk through multiple threads to see where the timing problem was. The timing problem is um, a fraction of a fraction of a second and you can't detect that by walking through it which takes seconds per line of code. Um, so it's very very difficult. It's very very difficult to write code that does this. Oh another one is load balancing. Um, some threads have more work to do than other threads and you want to somehow influence that part of the work to be getting more of the processor. These are, these are incredibly different, difficult things to do and there's one um, example of code that's used to explain wait and notify. It's called the producer-consumer architecture. So this is a software architecture where um, multiple threads are assigned to produce work and do work. So the producer thread creates something that they're going to pass to the consumer threads. And it can be used for anything. It's an architecture. It's not a specific application. Um, whatever kind of application you're working on that's multi-threaded and there are different threads with different responsibilities, you can set up the producer-consumer architecture. And the advantage of it is it's 
really simple enough so that when it stops working, you can figure out what was going on because there's an expected pattern of what should be going on. So I'm going to go through the producer-consumer architecture with an example, um, a very, very simplest possible example so that we can see how um, one thread would be waiting for another thread to notify it that something is going to happen. So let's do it in code. Let's look at the um, producer-consumer software architecture. Okay, so in this example, we're going to do something similar to what we did last time. So we are going to have multiple threads um, accessing a single object. And this time we're going to call the threads the producer and the consumer. Now, the producer's job, let's assume that the cup is empty for now, the producer's job is to take the lock on the object and put data inside of the object and then give the lock back. It's that easy. Suppose the producer doesn't give up the processor and it tries to do its job again. It takes the lock and it finds out that there's already something in the cup and it can't do any more work. It would clobber that data. So it goes into a wait state. A thread that's in a wait state cannot do anything until it's notified. When it goes into a wait state, it gives back the lock so that another thread can come along, like the consumer thread. The consumer thread takes the lock on the object and then it consumes the contents and it gives the lock back. When it consumes the contents, it also calls a method notify all. So any threads that were waiting for this object, that were in a wait state on this object, are then notified that they can leave their wait state and try and get the processor back again. So suppose the consumer now tries to consume again. It will take the lock on the object. It will see that there's nothing available. So it goes into a wait state. And it will wait there until somebody notifies it. When it goes into a wait state, it has to give the lock back so that the producer can come along, put something into the cup, and then notify the consumer that there's something there. So it's a very easy um, balance for these threads to coordinate using the wait and notify methods. Now, let's look at the code. The code is really very simple. Here's the test. We're going to make one object of type cup. And we're going to pass that to two thread objects, consumer and producer. Just ignore the one for now. It's possible to have more producers and more consumer threads and it will still work. But for now, we're just going to have the, we're just going to have one of each. So let's look at the consumer thread first. The consumer thread, the run method of the consumer thread is really easy. It's just, it 10 times it tries to get something out of the cup. Um, we have the sleep for some random amount of time just to make it easier to see the behavior of what's going on. And the producer, its job in its run method is to try to put something in the cup. So there's no code in the threads that is about coordinating the behavior of the threads. The coordinating of the threads is done in the data object, the shared data object, which in this case is the cup. So let's look at what's going on in the cup in the put and get methods. First of all, it's synchronized code and you can only use wait and notify inside of synchronized code. Okay, so let's think about 
Um, let's think about the producer first of all, calling its put method. There's a flag, an available flag. If there's already something available, then the producer cannot produce something else. So the first thing that happens is, if available is true, that means there's already something in the cup, and the producer will go into a wait state. Suppose there wasn't anything available. Available is false, then we will fall down here and immediately set available to true, and successfully put the value into the cup. It's just an integer for now. Put the value into the cup and then call notify all. Notify all allows any thread waiting on this object to um, regain the lock and start, start executing code again. So let's look at the behavior of the consumer. If there's nothing to get, if there's nothing available, the consumer can't do any work, and it goes into a wait state. If there was something available, that would be false, and we would... <laughs> if there was something available, not available would be false, and we will actually be able to go and do our work, which is to just cons return the contents. That's what the consumer does. So do you see how these two are coordinating? One thread is calling this method, and one thread is calling this method. And if the put, if the producer, if it gets there too soon, it will go into a wait state until it gets notified that it's okay. And similarly, if the consumer gets there too soon, it will go into a wait state until it's notified that there is something to consume. So what we're looking at here is not an application, it's a pattern. And you can build an application on this pattern where the producer might be producing an order and the consumer threads are have the job of processing that order and um, you can it, it's it's a very valuable pattern in and it it's it's a good way of explaining the wait and notify methods let's talk a little bit about load balancing suppose the consumer has a whole lot of work to do um, We could add another consumer thread. We'll call this one consumer2, and we can start that thread. And we don't have to change anything else. So if you find that um, one of your threads is just in a wait state all the time, you might want to add more threads on the other side so that the the threads are not waiting too much so this load balancing um, among the different parts of the application is is really easily implemented with this let's run this using two consumers and one producer and see what happens so the, the producer produced a zero and consumer number two got that zero. And then I wonder if consumer number two is getting all of them. No, there's consumer number one got some work done. Consumer number one got some work done there. But if you count these up, um, each number was produced and consumed only once. And that's, that's our objective um, of these coordinating threads. And that's, that's the pattern. So I, I hope that I, I'm going to go through and show you the code. And I would like you to type these in yourself. And that makes it more understandable when it comes off of your fingers. So I'm going to go through each of these so that you can pause the video and you can um, type this code 
exactly the way that I have it. So here's the consumer thread. It's all very simple, no more than 20 or 30 lines of code. And here's the producer thread. The producer 10 times tries to call put. And here's the interesting one, the cup, which has the synchronized code in it. The synchronized code controls the lock and the wait and notify methods control the coordination between the threads. There's lots and lots of different ways to use wait, notify, notify all. Um, most of them will have you creating code that's too hard to understand and it's too hard to get working. So there's, there's pros and cons of, of using multi-threaded code. I'll make a few concluding remarks and then we'll end this video. Well, I hope you made it to the end. But they, uh, I just want to say a couple of things at conclusion of this. Um, Multi-threading code is very difficult and it's very important. So um, as we increase the, the capability of the hardware, one of the ways we're doing that is to add multiple processors. So how are we going to make use of multiple processors for solving one problem? We are going to have to somehow deploy, de the deploy coordinating threads onto processors or cores. It's very difficult. We, we need to be able to test the code and to verify that it will work all the time. It feels to me like we are going backwards a little bit in software development. We are accepting that sometimes the code won't work, but that's okay. Most of the time it does, so just put it out there and see who complains about what the loudest. And instead of um, making sure that we have something that's designed and debugged and tested properly before we give it to the customer, and it's, it's making the use of technology a little bit frustrating for the consumer, the consumer of technology that doesn't work well. <laughs> um, a lot of it is, is not testing software or, and, and, and software developers trying to use mechanisms that are so complicated that they can't eventually get them to work reliably. We need to take a step back and make sure that if, if our code is so complicated, it's, it's, it's all we can do to get the code working, then who's going to modify it? And who's going to add something to it to make it, to improve it and so on? It's, a, it's one of the most important subjects that we have to make these threads, coordinating threads work correctly. And it's one of the hardest jobs that we have in software development. We've got a long way to go. It's up to you guys now to make this work and make it reliable. I'll see you next time.